My name is Albert Mavashev, and I'm going to be talking about memory leaks. And, um, you know, I started uh, software development about 16 years ago in school. And my initial project where I started was uh, C, C++, an assembler. And I'm sure most of you know uh, when you deal with these languages that a lot of times you deal with memory leaks. And I remember myself locked up in the, in the, in the labs where I would spend hours, sometimes days, trying to track down you know, these nasty memory leaks. Now, when Java came out, I started you know, programming in Java. I thought this was great, you know, the garbage collection and memory management and all this. So memory leaks will be you know, a thing of the past. Um, Although I discovered the opposite, where you know, because it's all kind of taken care of by the underlying machine, by the VM, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly what happens to memory. And you know, um, sometimes things happen under the covers, and you're not really sure, you know, is this actually released or not. So, um, and then the the flip side of that as well is that some people who are not, some developers who don't have a very strict uh, memory management. Uh, kind of practice in Java, then end up writing really poor code, um, where in fact that, that you have instead of having kind of a more efficient code, you end up with actually bloated code with memories leaking all over the place. So, and in fact, you know, I talked to some of the Java developers, and I would say, well, there is no real Java leak. There's no real memory leaks in Java. And I would say, technically, it's probably true because all memory is probably accounted for and it actually resides on the heap. It's not like in C, C++ where you drop a reference and it's gone. Um, you can't really get it back. So it's kind of difficult to track them. So in Java also it's very interesting because sometimes leaks are not really leaks because they're really part of a normal workload, right? So if you blow out your heap space, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a leak. It may be that your heap or your VM is not properly sized. So therefore, this whole concept of a leak is kind of, I mean, you got to take it with um, a little bit of grain of salt here. But nevertheless, I remember when I, you know, and even now when I code, and I do code, um, I sometimes I spend a lot of time trying to profile memory and trying to understand why I'm getting these nasty out of memory exceptions. So. When I started looking at this problem and my background is in performance monitoring, I tried to say, well, I don't really want to spend all this time trying to figure out why there is a problem or if there is a problem. I want to be able to automate that somehow. And I started to deconstruct VMs and I started to look at this problem in a little more detail. Um, so I look at the really two perspectives of, um, uh, of the JVM. So an example. Obviously, when you look at the, when you're running a VM, and before we get into the multiple VMs, so let's look at one instance. You get one VM, and from the operating system, there's a view of the VM from the way the operating system views it, right? So you're looking at, you know, the memory footprint. You're looking at handles. You're looking at, you know, threads. You're looking at CPU utilization of the VM. And then you're looking at actually when you run within a virtual machine, you have a little bit of different view of the memory usage. And that's typically what we call heap, right? And then you have allocation and you have garbage collection. And in fact, you can have a situation where this perimeter kind of stays kind of constant, where the box in, the, in, in between is kind of like goes up and down, up and down. And then oftentimes, I remember when we um, had one of the applications installed at uh, one of our clients, they would say, well, you know, how come you know, this perimeter is at, you know, 4 gig, but really inside it's really something different. I mean, why doesn't it release the memory? So you end up all these kinds of questions which sometimes is very difficult uh, to quantify. So when we look at memory leaks, and one of the interesting things is you can have leaks that are kind of in the perimeter, right? So you can have leaks in these green sections, and then you can have leaks that are in the in the in the box in in the middle. So a, a good example would be, which is you you find oftentimes, it could be a bug, right in the VM itself, which could potentially be leaking memory. So you have an expansion in the perimeter while 
the heap in, internally actually is fairly constant. So that's, that's one way. So if we look at, for example, there's obviously different ways that you can allocate heap size. So here's an example of a, when you start a VM and you pre-allocate the heap all up front, right? In that case, the perimeter of the VM kind of stays the same. So from the operating system point of view, let's say you're doing a four gig uh, VM, this will fairly stay constant. Let's just assume there's no leaking outside of the VM in terms of the handles or threads or anything like that. But my heap size can fluctuate quite dramatically internally, meaning the memory that I'm actually using. So here's an example of 10%. So as I'm running in the VM, I could be seeing a 10% memory utilization, 90% free. But from the outside, I'm actually using all, all four gig, right? So if somebody were to look at it and say, well, you know, this VM is, a, if I'm just looking at the OS perimeter, I'm gonna say this VM is outside, you know, it's probably leaking memory because, oh, I'm using all this memory. So that could be a false positive right there. And I think it's important to realize, and I think most of the, when I talk, again, Java developers, they really focus on this and really not so much on that outside layer. And in fact, you can have a situation where you're running here and actually everything is perfect, but let's say you're loading a, a Gen I like a library and it's got a leak inside. That would be part of the address space of the JVM. And in fact, the perimeter can grow outside and you can experience a memory leak without actually having a problem inside the JVM. And those are typically very hard to, to trace down because it's in the bowels of the, of the dynamic link library, which is kind of tough to, uh, to, uh, to detect. And then obviously tough to diagnose. You have to talk to your you know, third party provider, whoever's providing the actual DLL to figure that out. So a fairly complex problem, especially if you're, you know, when in development you're dealing with one or two instances, but if you actually deploy and running application in, you know, in live environments, you don't really want to have these type of problems happening. You want to be able to kind of proactively detect it and proactively figure out if in fact you have one VM that's kind of what I would call in a leaky situation or leaking. So here's another example where you have a, a floating heap, right, where the perimeter and the internal can actually flow, right? And it obviously depends on how you, you know, you start up your VM. But again, all these examples, so that I think what, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that you can't just look at one perspective and you can't look at the other perspective. You have to really look at both perspectives. And again, like for example, and we look, um, I mean, a very clear example with let's say JDBC, right? You can create you know, statements and sometimes, you know, you, if you don't close the statements, you in fact will cause a, a memory leak while the statements themselves could have been garbage collected, but the resources that are being allocated, the database resources may actually be still uh, part of the VM. So you gotta be really careful about that. So what are the typical symptoms um, of leaks? And um, I know that the typical one that people get is out of memory. And there's obviously different kinds of out of memory exceptions. You can have a heap out of memory, a heap exception, or you can have a perm gen exception, um, which uh, most cases actually deals with class loaders, which is uh, also very hard to trace. Um, so that's one. So if you get one, you know definitely you have a memory problem. Um, and what typically happens is, is then people then look at the stack trace and say, well, which thread actually reported the problem, right? And they think, well, that's probably where, you know, the memory leak is. So the diagnostic is typically looking at where the, um, the thread is reporting the problem. In most cases, it's actually not the case. It's not where uh, the memory leak is. Um, it also could be not a leak at all, right? You just not sized your JVM appropriately. So if my application goes into database, loads a billion rows, um, and my JVM is sized for a gig, I'll probably blow out that heap right, you know, in a few seconds. It's not really a leak. It may be a design flaw. It may be a problem in the sizing. Maybe you need to change your application logic. So again, leak, I would 
use it either, you know, you, you don't have it sized properly or you have a problem in the, in the, um, in the application. Now, increasing GC activity, that's one of the others. I mean, if you monitor, for example, garbage collection activity and you see that the, the frequency and the timing of the GC collection start to expand, I would say you don't even have to wait until you hit a 90% or 99% heap utilization. You would probably, you probably need to start looking at, you know, uh, looking at the application a little closer. And obviously, as a developer, you know what the workloads are. So if you know your application is sitting doing nothing and suddenly you're getting these types of problems, the most usual answer is probably you have a leak, right? You may have a background process or a background thread that's keeping connections and maybe it's just eating up resources. So the obvious, you know, you have, you know, increasing heap usage, which is typically what people do, or the not so obvious, you have these other interesting leaks that are a little more uh, complicated to, to troubleshoot, especially the class loader leaks, right? Um, when you deploy, redeploy the applications in the application server, a lot of times you get into these class loader leaks. So now imagine you have a farm of application servers and you've got all these variables. Um, what is, how do you typically try to figure out if maybe one of them is at risk, maybe the other one is not? If you have a clustered environment, you may have copies of the same application running across. So you have a memory leak in one, you probably have a memory leak in all of them, right? So you typically want to be able to address those instead of try to rep, you know, over provision the app, right? So instead of if your application typically deals with two gig space, maybe you want to give it six, but now you're wasting so many resources just trying to mask a problem. Um, now, again, this is one of the interesting ones because even if GC activity picks up, I think you also may want to look at the workload. There may be a change in the workload. So interesting things. Now, the typical causes of, of leaks. Now, uh, some of the simple, some of them are not. And what I found, in, you know, when dealing with Java, you end up with, you know, a simple one like you stuffing things into the array or a hash table and maybe you're stuffing in an object and you didn't overload the hash, you know, the hash code properly. So when you try to remove an object, it's actually maybe you're not removing the same object or you're not cleaning it up appropriately. So um, um, as I mentioned also GDBC connections, I find a lot of uh, leaks have to do with just not properly closing statements. Some of them are actually buried in the drivers themselves which becomes even tougher to deal with, right? So you're using, for example, some third-party driver to connect to a SQL Server and Oracle, and that's leaking memory, which is then kind of, uh, you try to figure out, well, what can I do about this? Well, you can detect it, and maybe you can somehow avoid that problem, but, and then report it, obviously, to the vendor. Also, you may have bad JVM arguments, right? Uh, this is one of the examples, right? So. Um, that you need to look at as well. And outside of the perimeter, as I talked about that, is typically had to do with things like, and then when we, for example, when I you know, developed a monitoring solution for Java, I mean, we looked at things like not just the heap utilization, but also, for example, handles and threads and the memory semaphores and things like that. So you want to be able to look at those as well. Now, a typical a typical, so these are the typical uh, causes of leaks. Um, and the, the interesting thing is, and as I talked about, about specifically a class loader, here's a, 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 an example which is actually very difficult to deal with where you have an old class loader that has a specific set of classes and static fields that it, got, it has loaded. Um, it, keep, it typically keeps it in the perm gen pool and then as you redeploy the application, you create a new class loader that creates a new set of classes and then stuffs it in the perm gen pool. In fact, we had an example of that. We developed a little module that actually hooks into the class loader. And if you keep on creating new class loaders, you end up with a, with a leak and then your application server falls over. Now you have people obviously interacting and if you're not watching them appropriately, your application server suddenly falls and then it's out of service. Now, typical remedies. 
Now, the typical remedies, I mean, most of the time I see people basically increasing the heap size. I say, oh, you know, 4 gig is not enough. We need to have an 8 gig. Now they end up to the 8 gig. It's not enough. We've got to go to whatever, 16 gig. Um, typically, what you'd find is typical remedies is, you gotta, especially in Java, I would say most of the time it's a bug in the code, right? Or if you're not properly sizing the workload, you just didn't properly size the VM. But most of the time, if you have a problem with the memory, there's really not much you can do other than fix the code, right? I mean, you can provision over provision, you can take it maybe offline, maybe you can fail over, but reality is, if you're talking about a remedy, can I fix, can, can it be automatically fixed? I would say probably not, because somebody is somewhere in not closing statements, is not closing files, is not you know, stuffing stuff in the memory, maybe not properly designed um, application where it reads the stuff from the database as an example and just not releasing it. But we see most oftentimes it's really over-provisioning is the answer. And then they wait until they exhaust it and then maybe fail over. And what we're trying to, and I'm going to try to show here is an early detection system that will try to basically attempt to do it automatically. Now what that means is, um, and I'm going to show examples of that, it's not going to give you 100%, but what it will give you is the probability of a leak in the, in the VM, right? With a very high degree of probability, say, well, these, this one or the other one is in fact, is a candidate for a memory leak. And what it allows it to do, why would you want to do that? Well, one is it gives you really the time to buffer, right? and time to solve a problem, and time to diagnose the problem, before you actually you end up in a situation where the application just, server just falls over. Second thing is, a lot of times it's very difficult to replicate the problem. You know, you may have, let's say, a production environment where the applications are running, but it's very difficult to replicate that problem in dev. So it would be actually quite nice to be able to say, well, this application server is not behaving properly. Maybe I want to try to take it offline and diagnose it while the problem is actually occurring versus having to take it down, restart it, and then task my developers with actually trying to replicate that problem. That time is actually takes a long time to do. I mean, I found, for example, I work with a team of developers that rep replicating problems are typically very difficult, especially in highly concurrent environments with many users. I mean, how do you replicate the problem where you have a thousand users connected and you have all kinds of things going on over the same time. So a lot of times just the load is difficult to replicate. I mean, you may be using some you know, software you know, for trying to replicate load, but it's still not the same thing as real users doing real things on your, in your environment. So I'd rather look at my farm of application servers and gonna say, well, this application server may have a problem. I wanna be able to isolate it, take it offline, and give them my, my developers to actually diagnose the problem while it's happening. And really avoids the crisis situation, right? Now, if you're over-provisioning and you can do failover, that's great, but you know, many times you have maybe one or two instances and you have a problem, if you have a clustered application, the problem is in all of those, right? So you just take one offline, but it actually is, you know, it still exists in my other instance. So it doesn't really solve the problem, but I want to be able to avoid the, you know, the crisis situation. I don't want end users calling me and telling me, hey, you know, I just submitted an order and I'm sitting timing out. And why? Because my application server is stuck on a, you know, in GC and it's paused, right? You can't process anything because the VM is stuck. So unfortunately, not, not a real good fix, other than trying to do some diagnostics and preventive actions. And still has to really go back to development to try to figure out why. And we're trying to basically help that process and reduce that process. Also very interesting, for example, I would call it aggressive leaks. A term I call aggressive leak. Now what an aggressive leak is, I mean one of the things, if you look at the, and we're gonna go and look at the chart patterns. Um, you're gonna find that any leak has a certain trajectory, but aggressive leaks are very, have a very obvious one, right? You start it up, and in a matter of minutes or a few minutes, you're gonna see that you know, 
spike. And it's good if you're watching it, it's great. But if you're kind of not watching it, then you, know, you're not even, you don't even know that there's a problem. So restarting it, uh, VMs could be a solution, but if you have an aggressive problem, restarting doesn't really help you, right? Because after a few minutes, it falls over. So we're going to talk a bit about leak detection. And um, one of the interesting concepts, I mean, and the way I looked at the problem, I myself is one of the things I do uh, you know, kind of on the side, as a part of, kind of my, think of it as my, my hobby, is I do technical you know, chart analysis related to stocks. And I'm sure many of you do as well. Uh, you, know, you trade stocks and you look at the charts and you say, well, this is, uh, you know, the stock is going you know, high and this is good, I want to buy that. Or the stock is going low, I want to sell that. So uh, I do a lot of the technical chart analysis and then I say, well, this is interesting because it really applies to the resource consumption because it's really a supply and demand um, equation, right? You have a limited supply of um, a stock as an example and there are people that want to buy it and at some point the supply and demand equation meets. Um, with resources it's kind of very similar, right? You have a limited supply of virtual memory or memory and you have demand. Applications are coming in and kind of trading that, right? They're buying certain, you know, they, or they take on some memory and then they, well, they don't they don't need it, they release it back into the pool, right? So if that balance is out of whack, what you're gonna have is you're gonna have a chart pattern, which we're gonna show, is kind of like this, right? It's good when you have a stock, right? It's going here because you're making money, um, right? You're making money, you're very happy. When you look at VM usage, you're not that happy, right? It's just a little bit opposite, but reality is you take the labels and then you put different labels and the story is the same. Right, the story is very much the same. So here's an example of a VM heap usage, and it's kind of you could, you're going to see that VMs. If you monitor, for example, C C plus plus applications, you're going to see a very fluid memory graph. Right? Why? Because the memory is created or allocated and deallocated by the application, and you don't get these jumps. Well, the reason why you get these jumps typically is because you have a you know, uh, a buffering of the memory and then the GC kicks in and then releases it, right? So you have these, you know, kind of spikes. So clearly, this kind of a pattern is very much steady. Even though you see ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs, the theme is a fairly steady um, uh, trend line, right? Versus here, the trend line here is actually accelerating. So. What you want to do is basically trying to look for these trend lines, and we're going to look a little more further. Now, this is what I would call a resource accumulation, very much like in a stock. You have an accumulation, you know, people are coming up and buying, you have, you know, rise in the stock price. So now, if I change the labels completely, I have the same really equation. Here I'm looking at GC duration. And I can put that chart up and I can say, well, it really follows the same pattern, right? If, I, if my GC duration is fairly low, I don't really need to worry about anything other than maybe if it's too low, maybe there's no activity on the application server, maybe that's something I need to worry about, right? But those are, those are not, that's not would be, wouldn't be an indicative of a problem in memory. This could be an indication of a workload Right? I have an expansion in the workload, which doesn't necessarily tell me there's a leak, but it tells me that there is an increase in activity. Right? And if I have pause times that are increasing, I know that my performance is going to be degrading. And I don't want that. And again, same pattern. If my GC activity or GC duration is fairly constant, then it's not really an issue. Right? So looking at simply chart patterns, it really becomes obvious because I can look at anything, whether it's a CPU memory and leaks, and figure out if I have a problem or not. One of the interesting ones, I actually have a phone, I just got a new phone, and I was saying, well, you know, and yesterday my battery started dying. So I was thinking, well, can I apply that same concept to batteries? And I thought probably not, because batteries, you really get always, oh, let me, skip that, you always really get a line down, right? It's not really 
I've never seen a phone that every time you talk, it really goes up like this, right? It's kind of a depleting resource. So it always goes down until there is a recharge. So it's interesting because some of these resources are kind of, I would say, perishable, and some of them are non perishable. So this is method really for non perishable resources, right? Things that are, could be claimed and reclaimed and given back. But if you have a perishable resource, you know, I don't need to be a scientist. I know the line will be down, and that's the expectation. So you want to also look at that are you looking at the resources that are kind of perishable or these are non perishable resources? So, anyway, let's dive in a little deeper into one of these, I would say, one of these things and expand it a little bit. And what you find is um, when I looked at most of the leaks, I mean, you can obviously have a lot of noise going on, right? You can have ups and downs and all kinds of things going on. But in reality, is if you abstract it, you're going to have a pattern that's very obvious. You have a trend line up, you have a channel, and then you have higher lows and higher highs. So if I'm looking at a hundred percent, you know, if I'm looking at a, let's say a VM farm of, you know, let's say ten application servers, whatever the number may be, I really need to look at this type of a pattern, right? You have a higher highs, I mean higher highs and a higher lows. An example, if I have higher lows but no highs, I don't really care because I'm not going to really blow out my heap space, right? So if my high here somewhere is at a hundred percent, but I never end up in the high highs, it doesn't matter. I mean, it may be a behavior of my application or workload, but it's not really going to get me in trouble. So this leg up will be my memory allocations when you create your statements and you create your objects, and this will be a leg down, which is basically a GC activity. But at the end, if I look at the span of, let's say, hours, I really need to see that kind of a pattern before I start to to, to, to say, hey, I have a problem. Well, here's an interesting, the other one, which is um, an interesting uh, pattern, which is you have steady lows, which is it basically goes on the case, but then you have higher highs, which could represent a problem, but I wouldn't call it a, a leaking or a memory leak. Why? Because I would call it a workload expansion. Now, I can be, the application server might be taking on more work, but all of the memory that it's doing is actually reclaimed back, right? So yes, it could get you in trouble where I can hit 100%, but that's to me more of a sizing issue rather than a leaking problem. So, and there are other variations like that. The concept is, and again going back here, is that for, for me to be able to detect without looking at the VMs, without having myself being glued to a screen and saying, hey, is this VM you know, having a problem or not, I really need to wait to automate this process, right? I need to, number one is, look at resource allocations, whether you're talking about CPU, memory, or basically any, any non-perishable resource that you're looking at. Whether it's from VM perspective or from the operating perspective, right? If I'm just monitoring a process and all I wanna know, does it follow this pattern, I should be able to look at it, understand it, and write a program, so to speak, right? Write some kind of an automated process that would be able to actually collect that data from a variety of different places. And it's actually with a very low overhead, right? I don't need, I don't need you know, special you know, instrumentation to do that. Anybody who has some JAMX, some basic programming, uh, you can probably hook up to a, you know, a, a VM, any VM remotely, and start sampling um, activity and try to figure that out. So it doesn't really take, um, you know, special skills to collect the data. So let's go back. Um, but it does take um, a, a method or a methodology in order to actually detect it. So here's an example now we're trying to say, okay, so we know what kind of pattern we were looking for. Now, by induction, we kind of say, well, if we know how to detect in one, we should be able to, you know, very quickly to devise how we detect in many, right? So here's, I have a bunch of VMs, and even though they're not scaled appropriately, but I have different performance characteristics. If I build kind of a chart for each one, and 
I, uh, what I call a determined detection model for a single VM, and then I uh, implement it across, I should be able to automatically detect the problems, right? I should be basically go to a point where I get an email if I'm, let's say, an application supporter or, uh, or a developer and I'm tasked with supporting an application that's running in production. I don't want to be kind of waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning maybe and have a, you know, a wake-up call saying, hey, we have a fire, you know, a crisis situation, go figure it out. I want to have a more proactive way to be able to come in avoid the crisis, knowing that I have a problem on the application server, and then really try to figure out what to do about it. So use, use this method for one, apply the model across multiple VMs. Um, you can monitor, and I would, obviously my recommendation is monitor perimeter, operating system per perimeter, but also within the JVM itself, and then try to actually correlate the two. And one of the interesting things is, Every resource has a different, um, you know, measure, measurement, right? You have heap measured in megabytes, gigabytes, CPU measured in, the percent, in percentages. So I want to be able to normalize all this. I don't really want to even know what it is. So one of the things, what we've done is applied what we call a momentum oscillator. We're going to talk about what a momentum oscillator is. But momentum oscillator basically allows you to apply kind of a little bit of mathematics, not, a, not anything complex, but say, I don't care exactly what it is. If my oscillator is showing me a problem, I know that I need to pay attention, right? I don't, I don't care if you're talking about gigabytes, a CPU, memory, or anything like that. So building that model allows you to basically build an index, kind of a resource index. I know I'm going to go into that in a, in a minute. So the concept or kind of the vision here is I have a farm of VMs, I have that index that basically tells me I have a problem, I don't have a problem, and then I typically get a notification when in fact there is and telling me exactly which VM. Then I use my diagnostics tools to figure out what the problem is, right? So this is not going to tell me, hey, you, you're not closing your JDBC statements. This is going to tell me this is the problem. Now get your developers or whoever understands this application, get them to use whatever tools they need to now diagnose the problem. So let's look a little um, deeper into the, um, into the mechanics of, um, of that. Now, the oscillator. Now, it's going to look very similar, but the concept of the oscillator is that no matter what it is that you're monitoring, it's going to compress it and really provide uh, a metric that is fairly consistent across. So you got an oscillator that goes from 0 to 100, and it goes up and down, up and down, or up. I mean, it depends on exactly what, how your resources are uh, allocated. But the bottom line is you want to stay around 50, right? This means that... And the way that the oscillator works is basically it measures the speed of advances and declines in the underlying metric, whatever it is that we're monitoring. Could be, you know, heap, could be CPU, um, memory, handles, threads, whatever. And trying to figure out if, in fact, we, the advances outpace declines or they, in fact, even and the speed of those advances and declines. So in a sense, I could apply this to garbage collection, duration, CPU memory, and this index will tell me whether I need to pay attention or not. So here's an example. If you're right here, it's not a question. You do have a, a problem. Anytime you're staying over 50 for a prolonged period of time, you will exhaust your resource. It's a matter of when. It's not a matter of if. If you're on this side, that means the application server is more or less actually decreasing memory. And you're going to oscillate around this axis. As soon as you start going above that and stay there, you typically have a problem. And there's certain, um, certain levels that we typically choose. One of the, uh, the ones we use is, for example, level 60, 70. Typically, you never get to 100. I mean, if you do, that means there was never a garbage collection ever. All of the advances were never followed by any declines, which is very difficult to kind of foresee in the application server. So if you're at this level, I would never see the probably that either, because all it means is there was never any allocations. There was always deallocations, which is 
not practical, right? You're not going to see that. So you're typically going to find yourself here, and then if you have a memory leak, you're going to be somewhere over here. Now, uh, so, some note here was actually the, um, um, developed this formula developed, and I'm going to show you an example of, uh, of the formula. It's not complicated at all, uh, how it's actually used. But this is uh, an example of an oscillator. Um, so instead of monitoring heap size, I'm actually going to be looking at, I'm going to take the heap size, feed it through the oscillator, and then I'm going to set my thresholds on the oscillator. Now, one of the maybe questions could be, well, why can't I just set a, you know, a, a threshold on the heap size? I'm going to say if I'm up 90%, I get an alert. Well, you could do that, but you're going to get a lot of false positives, or possibly you're going to get a full positive. Why? Because here's an example. I'm going to go back a little bit here. Here's the VM that's oscillating in the 90%. So it goes up, hits the 90, and goes down. Up 90, it goes down. Every time you're going to touch or exceed 90, you're going to get an alert or you're going to get a problem. Not a situation you want to be in. I want to be able to abstract it out and I want to be able to look at advances and declines and smooth it out. That's why the oscillator is a better, is a better concept, is a better approach. And we used it actually quite successfully. Um, uh, and we have you know, our own applications, and these applications get installed to the customer, and then they call and they say, well, you know, we believe you have a memory leak. Well, yes, let's look at the oscillators, let's look at what they tell us. Maybe it's a sizing issue. It's not really a memory leak issue. Now, building on top of that, this what I would call a steady state, so you want to be around here, is now that you're doing it for one, what's interesting is you can then have oscillators built on top of oscillators, right? If all of my oscillators are trending higher, if my oscillator, in fact, the top one, is watching the other oscillators, they, in fact, start trending higher. So here's an example where multiple VMs produce that index, which I would call an oscillator, right? It goes 0, 50, I mean, oh, let's say 30, 50, goes up and down. And I feed it through this function, and that becomes an input in my top oscillator. So that's my top level index. What it's telling me, if my index of combined index is in fact around this mark, it tells me that the combined resource allocation is in fact normal. Now this in itself could be out of, out of resources, which I'll get an alert, but as a combined VM farm, it's in fact in a steady state. I give you an example. Let's say this loses one gig in, in, in memory, this gains one gig. The net net is zero, as an example. This oscillator on top will show me a steady state, while maybe this oscillator will actually give me a warning, right? So, so you got to keep in mind that if I want to build a kind of a composite index here of my resource activity, I can do that. Now, you can do a little more something more sophisticated where you can actually feed multiple resource indices, right? You can have a memory index, a storage index, and maybe some other index. And what it really allows you to do then, and then you can weigh them appropriately, then you can develop kind of a top level index that tells you what is the resource consumption actually looks like across multiple VMs. And this kind of a mathematical model, I mean, to me, um, is a lot more, I guess, appropriate than I like that model versus constantly hunting down for, you know, and trying to figure out, is, you know, I have a problem with, you know, heap or, or anything like that. And I gave it a kind of a name, the CRI, uh, kind of a um, combined resource index, right? Because I can apply it pretty much to anything I want. Um, so let's, let's move a little further. Uh, so some example, um, some calculations. I mean, this is not complicated stuff. I mean, this is fairly simple stuff. Um, so here's the way it's calculated. I mean, you take the number of past samples uh, and you take the exponentially moving average and of gains divided by declines over X period of samples. Now, if you want to simplify it a little bit, you can do a simple moving average. Uh, exponentially moving average is a little more, comp more complex to compute. Um, as you can see, for example, here, the, there's a division by zero possible. In this case, 
if there's a division by zero, what it basically means is there's absolutely no declines. There's always advances. That makes RS pretty much equal to, or makes the RSI by definition is 100. So the only way you can get to 100 is when there's absolutely no declines. So that's, I would use that as a simple formula to actually detect that, I mean, to, to, to apply that. So the only thing really you need to do is collect the data, collect the, um, or sample the data, build a kind of a history of your samples, fit it through this formula, get your, um, get your oscillator, and, um, and then feed it through other oscillators if you need to, right? Now, there are other oscillators that you can use, and I suggest if you want to you know, read up on that, you can just do a search on momentum oscillators. They're used very extensively in uh, technical analysis when you do charts and you're trying to understand whether the stocks are, whether you buy or sell. It's a similar concept. Um, let's look a little further. Here's an example. This is a real example, actually. Um, here's an example where we're looking at an automated leak detection where we're looking at a heap utilization at 41 while the index, the oscillator, is over 60. This is precisely what is happening in the leaking VM. Right? So setting up a threshold at 90 gives you absolutely no warning. Right? So here's an example. My VM, in fact, I have maybe VM instances. Let's say these are web store application servers. Would be web logic, whatever. Right? They're running. Here's the heap utilization. Look at these. This runs at 93%, 68 and 86. None of them are having a problem. However, this VM that's running only at 41, the oscillator is telling me that you need to pay attention to that VM. It's not behaving the way that you would expect it to behave. And you start actually looking into this virtual machine before it reaches 93 and you get your you know, famous out of memory exception. Right? So it's a, and the, I mean, it, it's interesting because you could look at this pattern and say, well, that's obvious, right? I mean, I can look at this pattern and say you have a problem. The, the, the basic principle behind it is I don't want to be looking at these charts. I don't want to be sitting there hooking up my performance monitors and looking at these charts all day long, right? I want it to be do it automatically. So th that's, a, that's a perfect example. And then you can do diagnostics. I mean, this is one of the tools we built, but the diagnostics is, well, now that I have a problem, let me go in and look at where the problem is. Well, I look at my top 10. Here's my, you know, here's my, you know, 27 megabytes, and depending on how your size is, well, let me look at, you know, what's going on. And you could see that, hey, my GC impact is so and so forth, and this, this, this is where I spend time. So the diagnostic is really secondary part, right? Now, I'm going to point you to the place where you have a problem. Use whatever diagnostic tool you have in order to figure that out, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, you do a, a heap dump, you know, and feed it through some tool and try to understand what the heap uh, structure looks like. But otherwise, it's really up to you. So in summary, I think we're, I think about 10, 15 minutes, right? What I try to put together here is kind of a method for you know, I'm kind of lazy. I, you know, I don't want to be sitting there with, you know, charts and looking at them. I want to have my system that's going to be out there looking at the farms of VMs or operating systems or whatever it is that you care about. Feed it through some mathematical, mathematical model, and I want to look at that one number. And then the other thing I want to be able to do is I want to be able to say, hey, if my oscillator is greater than 60 and stays there for five minutes or 10 minutes, let me know. And then tell me exactly which VM I need to pay attention to. That's, that's really the concept, right? right? Is I want to be, I want to have the system do all the, the heavy lifting, and I want to have a very high degree of probability that when I look at that VM, I'm most likely going to find a problem, right? And I have my developers actually look at that. The biggest thing is, again, I want to be able to avoid downtime. And I don't want to over-provision. I'd rather have this problem fixed rather than expanding my heap sizes until you know, I blow out my you know, memory and then order maybe more uh, service space. And then use your, whatever diagnostics tools you have to diagnose the problem. So that's the basics of, uh, of you know, my detection model. Now you can go do a search and 
you know, look at other momentum oscillators. There are other very interesting momentum oscillators you can use to, um, and there are other, you know, they're not fairly, you know, they're not complicated. And you can apply them in your own, you know, in your, in your own practice. Um, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, um, let me know. Is there a question? Oh, it can come up. And... Yeah, um, as I mentioned, we, you know, uh, I, I'm part of the company that actually provides the monitoring solutions, performance monitoring solutions. So one of the things we've done is we actually implemented that approach along with other indicators. I mean, this is one of the indicators, but that's one of the things that we do, meaning proactively looking at VMs, .NET, whatever, we have a variety of different uh, technologies that we support, and then figuring out if the patterns of behavior are in fact abnormal, meaning abnormal to a point where you need to look at that. We also provide some diagnostics to get into that as well. So it's a, it's a kind of a dual thing. You could go and build it yourself, or we have a product that actually does it out of the box. All you have to do is hook it up to your VMs, and we'll tell you which VM you need to look at and when. Um, you can use it with whatever diagnostics tools that you have. It's a completely independent outside, watches, activity, no overhead at all or very little overhead, whatever it takes to sample GC and memory out of VM and then tell you, you know, what the oscillators are, what those indicators are, and alert you when you have a problem. So that, that is, you know, it's already been implemented, it works, and, you know, customers use it for this specific purpose. Yes? Yeah, so the, the question was, is it only from VM perspective? And the answer is no, it's not. Um, is it an example? Um, of how to use it in VM, but it's actually any metric. I mean, you could use it from OS. You could use it for storage. You could use it for pretty much anything, again, for any resource that's not, as I said, it's not perishable, right, like a battery. I mean, you can also do it in a ba battery. It's just not that useful, right, because you know it's always down, right? Or you know I don't need to be, I don't need heuristic to figure that out. Anything that's a little more chaotic where you don't know exactly what the outcome would be, I want to be able to apply this method so that I know when I have a problem, when I need to look. So this is not specific to Java, even though we do have hooks into Java, could be used, and it's used in Java, could be used for .NET, anything that uses resources. I mean, okay, I, uh, pick, uh, am I the, the guy who will... Pick a, pick a name out of the hat. Yeah, well, so let me see what... Okay, should I, what is that? Um, what, I don't know what this, Akin Caldera, I, I can't pronounce this name though. Cellsoft, Cellsoft? Are they still here? No. Cellsoft. Gotta pick someone else then. Oh. Sorry. All right. Snooze you lose. I'm gonna close my. Pick the paper in the other corner. Oh. <laughs> Navis? Who's that? Yeah. Um, Michael, Michael Wiggins, no? Congratulations. Congratulations.